even think about plugging that one back in. Like you, never been anyone like you. You are worthy. Yes, 
Yes, you are worthy. Oh, there's never been anyone like you. Never been anyone like you. You are worthy. Yes, you are worthy. Hope is rising like the sun. The old is gone, the new has come. I fix my eyes on Christ alone. My rock, my shield, my cornerstone As we sing, God is so good God is so good God is so good He's so good to me We sing, God is so
temptation comes my way. And when I cannot stand, I fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. And when I cannot stand, I fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Scripture reading today will be found in Daniel chapter 9, and we're going to look at the majority of that chapter together. So we'll be reading Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 down through verse 23. If you want to follow along in the Bibles that are there in the pew in front of you, you can find that on page 938. And as you're making your way there, if you need a Bible or you know someone that needs a Bible, please take that with you. We'd love for you to take that and use it or share it with someone that may need one. And so that's our gift to you. If that pertains to you today, we'd love for you to take and use that. But Daniel Daniel chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, by descent a Mede, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that, according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet, must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. And then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. We have not listened to your servants and prophets who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us, open shame, as at this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, And to all Israel, those who are near and those who are far away, and all the lands to which you have driven them because of the treachery that they have committed against you. To us, O Lord, belongs open shame to our kings, to our princes, to our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in his laws, which he set before us by his servant, the prophets. All Israel, which has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice. And the curse and the oath that are written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, has been poured out upon us because we have sinned against him. He has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our rulers who ruled us by bringing upon us a great calamity. For under the whole heaven there has been, not been done anything like what was been done against Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us, yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. Therefore the Lord has kept ready the calamity and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works that he has done, and we have not obeyed his voice. And now our Lord, O Lord, our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself, as at this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. 
O Lord, according to all your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy hill, because of our sins and for the iniquity, iniquities of our fathers. Jerusalem and your people have become a byword among all who are around us. Now, therefore, O Lord, our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to the pleas for mercy for your own sake, O Lord. Make your face to shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. O my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations in the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas because, before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake. O my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, who had seen in the vision at the first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. And he made me understand, speaking with me and saying, O oh, Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas for a mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell you that you are greatly loved. This is the word of the Lord. If you would, pray with me, and then we're going to look at that passage together. God, we thank you uh, for this beautiful day that you've created. We thank you for the opportunity to gather in your name. We pray that as we spend time in your word and we seek you in all things, that you would lead and guide and teach us in all truth, that you would help us to see the reality of who you are and who we are in your sight and what you have done for us and what it means for us and our identity and the way we live in this world. And so we pray that you would be the one who teaches and leads and guides us in all truth today. We pray that the Holy Spirit would move in this place that you would take the eternal truth of your word and illuminate our hearts and minds to see more fully who you are and what you've made us to be and what you've called us to be. We pray that we would see all these things afresh today as we spend time in your word. We pray that you'd be glorified above all else as we do. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, there's a term uh, that I, one of my professors was fond of, or I should say a phrase that I have used for years here. If you've been around the church, you've probably heard me say it at different times. But one of my very f favorite professors, his name was Dr. Larkin, used to, when he was teaching, or when we were especially talking about something that was more complicated or different sides of it, he would say, we always want to land in the center of the biblical tension. And he would say that all the time, and it, and it stuck with me. And, and what he meant in, in a lot of ways is that God's word being God's perfect revelation to us about who he is and who we are in light of that. And and God has given us his word, and it shows us the reality of all things. And when we see the truth of who God is, that oftentimes it keeps us in this tension. That Because God is perfect in every way, and all his attributes are perfect, and they're held perfectly together, that there are different times that it kind of pulls at us in different ways. For example, God is perfectly loving and merciful, but he's also just, and he's holy, and both of those things kind of pull at us in different directions. But when we take all of what Scripture says, it keeps us in the right tension, right? In that perfect middle ground. And so he would say that all the time. We want to fight to stay in the center of the biblical tension. And it was kind of a warning that we didn't want to get way off to one side or overemphasize one part or pit them one against the other, but see how they perfectly come together. And so I was thinking about that, and I've said that a lot for years. There's so many times that kind of comes up. But I was really thinking about it even right now in our culture and the way the world is today. So much division, so many things get kind of framed into it's either this or that, one extreme or the other. And if you're not this, then you're that one. And the middle ground has kind of evaporated and it's caused all sorts of issues in our culture and around us. And what ends up happening is you can say something that's a very innocuous statement. And somebody will almost immediately, you know, you give an opinion, a thought, well, what about this? You ask a question and somebody go, oh, well, you're one of those, right? You're really conservative or you're really liberal. And they immediately want to take it and put it into a category of one versus the other. And it's all around us in a whole lot of different ways. But the truth is, if we hold fast to God's word, 
We do land in the center of the biblical tension. We want Jesus to be our Lord and Savior, Lord over all things in our life. As we say here all the time, we want to be growing as disciples, being obedient to Jesus in every area of our life. And if we're being obedient to Jesus in every area of our life, what will happen is we will be out of step with both of those extremes a whole lot of the time. If we stay in the center of the biblical tension, we're going to reject those extremes, and what's going to happen is we're going to be out of step in a whole lot of ways. But it's a really important thing to remember, especially in our culture today, of fighting to stay in the center of the biblical tension, right with what, what God tells us, and letting that stand above all else. See, the truth is God's Word is way more nuanced than our culture wants to make things. And I'm not saying it's, it's uh, that God's Word is, is wishy-washy or we can kind of pick and choose. I mean, when we hold fast to exactly what God says, it's going to correct us in a whole lot of different ways. Like Hebrews 4 talks about the, the Word of God is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. It's going to cut us at different places because how quickly we can get away from what Scripture actually says. And so I'll give you just a couple of examples. One of those is uh, the Bible's very clear on personal responsibility, that we have a personal responsibility for our sin and the things we do and what we're about. But the Bible's also clear that we have a corporate responsibility, that we're responsible for one another. And so our culture wants to make personal responsibility and pit it against a corporate responsibility. And the Bible goes, yeah, no, it's both. And it does that quite a lot. And so we do that in different ways, or we see that the Bible tells us that we're to die to ourselves. We're to be radically generous. We're to give without asking. Like somebody asks, we just give generously. But then it also tells us to be wise and prudent. And both of those things kind of can pull at you at different ways. And to land in the center of the biblical tension, you have to take both seriously and fight to see how they go together. Uh, the same is true. The Bible tells us that all people are made in God's image after his likeness, that they have inherent value because they are people made in God's image, and that is true of every single person on the planet. But the Bible also tells us that all of us are desperately sinful, that we can easily twist and distort things because of sin in the world. And you have to see both of those things together to get to the center of what the Bible calls us to and how we live in the middle of it. And so I want us to think a little bit today about how do we fight to and live in the center of that biblical tension. And I say that because I think Daniel is a really good example of this. And I think his prayer that he prays here in chapter 9 that we're going to look at helps us to see that. He says a lot of things that are very helpful for us just in our prayer life and how to continue to talk to God and walk with Him, but also to help us land in the center of that biblical tension because he says some things that are really helpful. And so the way I want us just to look at this passage today in Daniel chapter 9 is one kind of how we pray but on, on one hand, but on the other hand, how we stay in the center of that biblical tension because really both come together very nicely in this prayer and what he teaches us here. And so here's the things I want us to look at as we look at this prayer that Daniel's praying. As we pray... And as we fight to stay in the center of this biblical tension, one, we have to approach God as he's revealed himself, first and foremost. We have to approach God in the way that he's revealed himself. Secondly, we have to be honest about ourselves. And then lastly, as we do, we have to trust who we are in him. So we have to approach God the way he's revealed himself. We have to be honest about ourselves. But then we want to live out of who we are in him. And so I want to show you that here in Daniel chapter 9, right? So we're going to look at that passage together. But let me set the scene for you first. Uh, we've said as we've been going through the book of Daniel, not every chapter is chronological, kind of skips around a little bit. The second half of the book really is a lot of visions that God has given Daniel, and they're interspersed with the rest of the, the book. So when you go back, this actually takes place before chapter 6, right after chapter 5 chronologically, chapter 9 does. Uh, last week, we looked at the vision that God gives Daniel in chapter 8. Well, this chapter, chapter 9, takes place about 12 years after chapter 8. And so we looked at last week, chapter 8, how God gives Daniel this clear vision of how the Medes and the Persians are going to come and take over, and then after them, the Greeks. And we looked at all the imagery and how that points us to what unfolded in history. And so God gave Daniel that 12 years prior now, 12 years later, the Medes and the Persians have actually taken over. So he's starting to see the beginning of what God told him 
come to fruition. And so that kind of places us where we are. But there's an important thing that's happening here that he's wrestling with. If we go back to the very beginning, chapter 1 and 2, we looked at the very beginning. We said Daniel was taken into exile in Babylon when he was a teenager. And so way back as a teenager. Now he's an older man, much older, in his 80s now. Chapter 1 has now been 67 years since Daniel was taken off in, into <coughs> excuse me, captivity and what has happened. So he's lived for 67 years in Babylon. And he's reading God's word and he's spending time in it. And if you look there in verse 2, it says, uh, in the first year of his reign, talking about Darius, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. So he's reading in the prophet Jeremiah And God has shown Jeremiah, you're going to go off into exile, and this exile is going to last about 70 years. And so Daniel's reading that, sitting at year 67 of being in Babylon, and he goes, hey, that's getting pretty close. This should be just about over. And so he starts to pray to God about that, about what God has told him. And so that's kind of the... the, uh, the lay of where, he's, um, where he is right now, what he's dealing with. And so what he prays here is going to help us a lot about how we should pray, but also discipleship, how to live in the center of that biblical tension, right? And so he starts to pray to God, and the first thing that I want you to see as he starts to pray is he approaches God in the way God has revealed himself, right? Just even the way in which he starts to pray is based on what God's word has told him. That after 70 years, that God is going to deliver them. That that's how long the exile... And so he's believing God's promises. He's starting with God's word. And then he begins to address God in the way that he has revealed himself. And that is so important when we pray. We want to cultivate our relationship with the Lord. We want to come before him. We want to continue to walk with him. It's so important that we're saturated by his word and all that we say and we do and we pray and as we talk to God. It's so very important. If we're going to have a thriving relationship with God, it's going to be based on who he has said he is. If he is God and he has revealed himself and he is the one that created all things, then we're going to approach him in that way. And this is so important. And maybe that seems really obvious, but I'm going to tell you, all of us do this at different times. We remake God in our own image. That's what idolatry is. We start to worship other things ahead of God and we kind of remake God to be like we want him to be. And so what happens is we remake him in our own image. We remake him in a way in which our culture says that they think God would be like. And sometimes we do that unknowingly. We're so inundated with what our culture says about things, we go, yeah, well, God must be like that. And so we end up approaching God based out of our own conception of what he should be like or what our culture is. Or we just kind of see him as like uh, our guru, or the genie in the bottle that helps us when we need something. And so we begin to approach God in that way. And what can quickly happen is instead of approaching God as he is, as the all-powerful creator God who spoke all things into existence that is full of majesty and glory, we approach him as not as he is, but as we imagine him to be, or we would like him to be, or how we think he should be, or what our culture says he should be. And it ends up being like our helper that's there to attend to my whims and my feelings and what I'm dealing with in the moment. And God, hey, I need you to do this for me. He becomes our personal assistant in some ways. But that's not who God is. And that's not how we're called to approach him. But when we start to approach him that way and we treat God like that, it's kind of like if you've ever seen a parent uh, that's being kind of held hostage by their own kids. Uh, I'll tell you what I mean. Maybe you've seen this before. I, can, I have a, a time in my mind, uh, like in an airport, watching a mom with like a toddler, two or three-year-old, and trying to keep them happy. Do you want this to eat? And the kid's like, no, you know. Oh, well, what else? What else can I get you? Would you like this? Oh, honey, it's okay. And what happens is, is the roles have gotten reversed, right? Suddenly, the parent is, is every whim of the child, and I want to make you happy, and I'll do whatever you want, and the kid's running the show. And that is not a good idea. Just if you're unclear, a three-year-old should not be running the show. That's a terrible idea. 
But what happens is when we approach God that way, and God, I need this, and I need you to do this, and I need you to do it right now, and this is what it should look like, we're doing the same thing. We're becoming before the creator God of the universe that spoke all things to existence and treating him like you're here to do what I tell you to do. And when we do that, it messes everything up. It's going to have huge consequences and problems, just like the parent that's held to the whims of their child. It's detrimental to the child because they don't know what they're doing. (laughs) They don't have a clue. You're there to help guide them and lead them and help them grow. And it's the same as true if it flips upside down to where God is there to attend to my whims on how I feel and what I'm dealing with in the moment and the way I feel about it and not based on who God is, we've got it all backwards. And that will cause so many issues when we start to do that. And so if we're going to have this relationship with God, and by the way, that leads directly to getting out of the center of that biblical tension. Because we're now not approaching God as He is, we're approaching God Uh, in my own image, and that's going to cause all sorts of problems. But if we approach God as He is, that should be the basis of our relationship with Him, and that's exactly what Daniel does here. He comes before God, verse 3 says, I turn my face to the Lord God, seeking Him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. We could spend a whole lot of time just on that, but prayer and fasting and sackcloth and ashes, and he's, He's pleading for God's mercy, right? Fasting, without going into that, that's a whole another big subject part of prayer, but fasting, when we remove food or remove things from our life, it's to alert us of our great need for God, that we desperately need Him. And that's what Daniel's doing. That's the way he's starting. God, I desperately need you. I need your mercy. I am the one that's in need. I'm not here to tell you how things are. I'm here to come before you needing your mercy in my life. But then the very next thing he says, verse 4, I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. He comes before God and he's talking about how great and awesome God is, how he keeps his word. He approaches in a way that is built around God's glory and his holiness. You are great and you are awesome. Oh, God, I need to hear from you, and I need this in my life, and you're the thing that holds all things together. And he starts that way. And so what he's doing is a prayer at the beginning, a prayer of adoration. And oftentimes when we talk about how to pray and how to approach God, we say we should start with prayer of adoration. And that's true. We should start with who God is and praising him and seeing that he is great and that he alone is good and he is the one that holds all things together. I don't know if you noticed, but we actually did that in our singing this morning. We started with, God is so good, God, you are so great, Lord, I need you, right? We're starting with adoration, and then we're moving to what Daniel does here, confession. And so the first part here is we start with praying and crying out to God for who he is as he's revealed himself. But then the second part, which leads to that confession, is that as we come to him, And in our prayer life, but also wanting to stay in the center of that tension of what the Bible tells us, we have to be honest about ourselves. And so what does Daniel do right away? Verse 7, he says, To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us open shame. As at this day, the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, to all of Israel, those who are near and those who are far away in the lands which you have driven them, because of the treachery that we have committed against you. To us, O Lord, belongs open shame. To our kings, to our princes, to our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. And so immediately Daniel starts to confess sin and come before God, seeing clearly in the face of God who he is. He's a broken, sinful man, and he's praying in that way. He's praying in light of how God has revealed himself, how short he's come. And Daniel sees this in his self and in Israel. You see, he's praying, us, God on our behalf. He's praying for Israel and for himself. And he's saying, we have rebelled against you. And so there's a couple things I want us to think about, to be honest in our prayer, to come in prayer of confession. 
And the first thing I want you to notice here is the language he uses is that he is saying that sin is against God. And this is something if you've been around Coda for any given amount of time, I say this a lot. And it's very deliberate and purposeful that we say this. But all sin is ignoring or rebelling against God in the world he created. Sin is against God. And that's what he says here. Oh, Lord, we have sinned against you. You alone have we sinned against. He's saying this over and over again. And he's telling us that. See, when we see God as he is, as the creator, sustainer of all things, we owe all things to him, including our existence. He knows how his world works best because he created it, and he tells us how it works best. When we ignore the things that God tells us, or we openly rebel against the thing God tells us, that is sin. We're saying, I know better than you, I've got this. We're saying to the one who actually created us and everything we can see and everything we can ever fathom, I know better than you. All sin is ultimately against God. And that's the language that he's using here. And it's important for us to see that. If we're going to stay in the center of the biblical tension of who we are and who God is and how that relationship works, we have to see that sin is ultimately against God. The problem is we struggle with that, particularly in our culture. And this, this is where the whole part of we will be out of step with what the world says. Our world tells us today that sin is, uh, if it's okay to do whatever you want as long as you're not hurting someone else. Or it's okay to do whatever you want as long as you're being true to yourself. It's a big one today. And, and what we often mean is if you feel good about it and you think that's what's right for you, then do it. If it feels good, do it. But the problem is that's a lie. That's not true. Your true self is not your feelings. Your true self is not what the world tells you. Right? We've been talking about that all the way through Daniel. That Babylon stands as this kingdom, but also stands symbolically throughout the Bible of what the world says versus what God says. And the world says you don't need God. We trace that all the way through the Bible with Babylon. You don't need God, you can do it yourself, and that's what our culture tells you. You can trust your feelings and the way that you look at things, and you can see that. But the center of the biblical tension is, yes, you're made in God's image, but you're also marred by sin. And so your feelings betray you. In the sinfulness of our lives, our feelings will lead us to things that are the exact opposite of what God says. And if we build everything based on me and my feelings and what culture says, then what happens is I end up going directly against the things God says. But what God tells us is that sin is rebelling against Him. Our true self is only ever fully found in embracing what our Creator says is true about us. He knows you better than you know yourself. As the Creator and Sustainer of all things, He's the one that knows how everything goes together. And so we have to come in honesty before God, recognizing that when we have ignored him in the world he created, we are sinful. And all of us have. Every single one of us has. And so Daniel starts here confessing sin, confessing the sin of his people and the sin of himself. If you look closely, the second thing I want you to notice here is he uses a lot of corporate language, right? All the way through this. Verse 7, he says, Uh, To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us, open shame. Verse 8, to us, O Lord, belongs our shame. To our kings, our princes, our fathers, we have sinned against you. Verse 9, we have rebelled against you. Verse 11, because we have sinned against him. Over and over, we, us, our, almost everything he says. And if you've been with us to this point, we're now in chapter 9 of Daniel. We've been in this for a while. Daniel is a bright, shining light of what it means to be faithful to God in Babylon, is he not? We've seen all these stories of where he literally puts his life on the line to stand true for what God says. But yet, in everything you read here, it's we, us, our. You know, what's going on? Daniel's the faithful guy. Why is he not praying like, oh, Lord, help these poor sacks out that have screwed it up? He's saying, we, us, our, and all of this. Why is he praying that way? Because he's a sinner. And he knows he's a sinner. No one's perfect except for Jesus. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And Daniel knows this very clearly. 
In fact, verse 20 says, while I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel. And you go, yeah, but Daniel's killing it. He's putting his life on the line. He's standing firm. He clearly proclaims the truth. But the truth is when you follow God closely and you walk with him so closely, you see his holiness so clearly and it makes your sin that much more recognizable. And I think Daniel and his relationship with God and seeing his holiness and seeing how God is working and seeing God deliver amplifies the fact that he's a sinful man and he knows this. And the same is true for every one of us. And so it's important that we see that, that we recognize, that we are quick to confess, that we have blown it, that we do ignore God. We do go our own way. We do think I've got this and I don't need any help. We all do this at different times. But the second thing I want you to consider about the language he uses, right? Yes, we're all sinners, but then that corporate language he uses is an important point that helps pull us back to the center of the biblical tension. And I'll tell you right now, because we're in America, in the year 2021, I'm about to step on your toes. The Bible calls us to be responsible for one another. God saves you, and yes, there's personal responsibility, personal relationship with the Lord. We say that all the time. In America, that's the way we talk. Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? Yes, I have a personal relationship with Jesus. We go, okay, great. See you later. Glad you've got one. I've got one. We'll go our separate ways. That is true. The Bible does say personal responsibility. You are responsible. Your relationship with God and coming before Him and dealing with yourself being a sinner, and that you need God's grace in your life. And that's true. But the center of the biblical tension flies in the face of American individualism. Yes, I have a personal relationship with God. That's good, and that's right. But that's not the fullness of what God calls us to. And if you want to be in the center of the biblical tension, you want Jesus to be Lord over your life in every area of your life, There's no biblical, faithful discipleship that chooses to go it alone. I'm going to say that again. I want you to really think about that. There's no faithful, biblical discipleship that chooses to go it alone. Now, that doesn't mean that if you're in a situation, you're on the the, uh, desert island and you get saved and you're there by yourself that you can't have a saving relationship with the Lord and grow in that and whatever. God meets us where we are. But when God saves us, he saves us into a family of faith. And then he calls us to make disciples that make disciples. And then he fills the New Testament with all these commands of how we're to love one another and to care for one another and rebuke one another and correct one another and pray for one another and on and on and on and on and on. And he says, that's what it looks like. And if we're going to be in the center of the biblical tension, we're going to have a personal responsibility and a corporate responsibility. We are responsible for one another. And God clearly tells us that that's the case. And so I want you just to think about that for a second. I think that's partly why Daniel prays the way he does. Us, we, our, he is so tied with his people. These are my people, the people that God has called, and this is my family, and I'm praying for them, and I care for them, and we're doing this together. And so it's so important that we hear that that we see that. We miss that because of the culture we're in. We get pulled way to one side. It's just me and God. I'm going to tell you, it it makes me sad when I think about it because I've heard this over and over in the last two years. Coronavirus, everything that hits, everybody scatters, and I still know people that say this today. I kind of like just waking up on Sunday and sleeping in and having my coffee and watching worship on TV. That's kind of the opposite of what God calls us to as his family. That it's just you and God and your coffee and nobody else matters. God calls us into a family to walk with one another. And we could do a whole, I could go a lot longer on this. (laughs) I want to get off track. But you have gifts that you are meant to share with others. You are called to help disciple. We're supposed to walk together. We're not supposed to go this alone. We need each other. All of the things that God tells us is part of that. 
And so it's so important that we understand that God calls us into this family. And being honest about that, that we desperately need one another. And so when we be honest about ourselves, yes, we're all sinners. We see clearly that sin is against God. We desperately need one another. But then there's a last part to this too, as he's praying and as he's thinking about that. When we start to see this and we start to be honest about who we are and who God is, so we're, we're now approaching God as he's revealed himself and we're being honest about who we are in the midst of that and it starts in our life and we're seeing that. If we want to see change, we want to see discipleship, we want to see revival in the place we live, if we're going to live in the center of that be- uh, biblical tension, our lives have to be marked by humility and grace And that starts with us. And when I say us, I mean those that are followers of Jesus. We live in a world that's all jacked up in a whole lot of ways. And you've got these great uh, extremes and you're either this or that. And we're called to stand in the middle and be biblically faithful. But what happens so often is we can stand and go, I'm biblically faithful. And then look down on both people at either extreme. They got it wrong. And they got it wrong, and I can't believe those people are so wrong. But when we see God for who He is, and we, impre- uh, uh, we approach Him in the way that He's called us to, and confession starts to happen, I am sinful, and I am in need, and Lord, I need you. We continue to come back to that, and I want you to follow this reasoning. Grace changes people. It changes us. We see God's holiness. We see how far short we fall. I desperately need God in my life. And he begins to change us from one degree of glory to another because of his grace in our life. And so as we're seeing him as he is and we're seeing ourselves as we are, we're seeing our need for grace moment by moment and that grace changes us. And if we're going to show that to other people, then we have to be people that are showing what the grace of God looks like. And so that's not looking down, it's not pointing fingers and, oh, they're so wrong and they're so bad. It's, I desperately need Jesus in my life and I want you to know him too. It's a totally different thing. And when we start to operate in that way, if we want to see revival happens, revival starts with the household of God. It starts here. We are people that are so saturated in the grace of God and what he's done for us. We are so aware that we are desperately sinful and we so need Jesus. And then we begin to move out in those ways. You know, when you start to move from the center of the biblical tension, that tension keeps you in need, which is what you see with Daniel, right? He starts from the very beginning. I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession. I'm in sackcloth and ashes. I desperately need your mercy. That's the way he starts. You want to know how you're moving from the center of biblical tension? When you become self-righteous. When you become really arrogant. I have figured it all out. And this is the way you do it. And this is what it looks like. And I'm right on this. And those people are wrong. You've forgotten the grace that you so desperately need each and every day. And if we want to see change happening around us, We want to live in the center of the biblical tension, and we want to pull people into that with us. We are going to be people that are so saturated by the grace of God. I desperately need Jesus each and every day. That's all we have to offer in the middle of that, if we actually see who God is and who we are. It's the only place that we'll end up. And so we have to see that we desperately need grace. And that brings humility. And so being honest about ourselves includes confession, includes seeing that sin is against God. It includes recognizing that we need one another, but it's also operating out of we desperately need God's grace in our own life. But as you do that, it starts to reveal who you are in Jesus and what God has done for you. So look at verse 17. It says, now therefore, O God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to the pleas for his mercy for your own sake, O Lord. Right, that's a pretty good summary there. Who God is, approaching him for who he is. 
being honest about he, who he is in himself, desperately need mercy. He says, make your, fu- your face to shine upon the sanctuary which is desolate. O oh my God, incline your ear and hear, open your eyes and see our desolation in the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. Hear what he's saying. We're not saying we deserve for you to restore us. We don't. We need your mercy. Right? So seeing God as he is, seeing themselves as they are, we desperately need you. Lord, would you please do this? It's in keeping with your character and what you told us you're going to do. Right? And so that's the way he approaches. But then listen to the answer that comes back. This is a pretty cool scene if you think about it. He's speaking and praying. And why I was speaking and praying, verse 21, the man Gabriel who had seen in a vision at the first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. I don't know where Gabriel was, but he was somewhere far away. (laughs) And he comes really, really fast. Swift flight as he's praying. He's pouring out his heart to God, and he shows up. In verse 22, he made me understand, speaking with me and saying, Oh, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas for a For mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. And what Daniel hears in that moment is he's going, God, I need you, and we desperately need you, and we see who you are, and we see who we are, and how desperate we are for your mercy. God comes and says, you are greatly loved. And what Daniel hears is the same thing that you hear when you put your faith in Jesus. We say this all the time here. You are more sinful than you ever wanted to admit, but you are more loved and accepted than you ever could imagine, and it's all because of what God has done for you in Jesus. It's not your righteousness. That's what he says here. It's not our doing. We don't deserve this. We just need your mercy, and God says, yes, I will give you my mercy. You are greatly loved, and he meets Daniel there. He meets him there. And he gives them a vision that is so hard to interpret (laughs) that we'll look at next week. (laughs) He loves them so much, I'm going to give you a puzzle that everybody's going to wrestle with for the next 2,500 years. No, but he says to them, I love you, and I've got you, and I hear you, and I'm there with you, and I'm walking you through all of this. And it's the same thing that God says to us as he comes to us. And so there's a wonderful thing that happens when that's true. When you come to God as He is, it's kind of scary. He is the creator God who holds you into existence by the power of His Word. You exist because He says so. And as you get close, it reveals how far you fall short of who He is. But then as you approach and as you confess, you are met with the God that is so loving and so perfect in every way. And he says, you are well loved. I've got you in the midst of this. And that's exactly what he's done for us in Jesus. And so if we're going to live in the center of biblical tension, we're going to continue to grow in our relationship with God. We're going to continue to come to him in the way he's revealed himself, trusting in his provision and his mercy. We're going to be people of mercy that are resting in the love of God and what he's done for us in Jesus. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you that you are perfect in every way. We thank you for your holiness. We thank you for your grandeur, for your glory. We thank you for your power and your majesty. We thank you that you are just, that you care about setting all things right, that you are angry against the things that are bad and that are wrong, but that you are also loving and merciful and gracious and long-suffering and kind, and we thank you that you are all these things. We do confess that we fall so short of what you have called us to. In so many ways, we ignore you and rebel against you, but we thank you that you meet us in the midst of it, that you've done for us what we could never, ever do for ourselves in Jesus, and we can rest in that truth. So I pray that we would be people that are overwhelmed with your grace, that we would come to before you each and every day, confessing our sin and meeting you there and seeing our identity in Jesus and what it is you've done for us, that we would be lights 
to those around us, pointing them to your grace and your mercy always. We thank you for what you've done for us in Jesus, and we pray all of it in his mighty name. Amen. This is the time in our service where we get to take the Lord's Supper together. And as we do, we're really being reminded of everything that we just talked about. And so you'll find these little cups there in your seat. Uh, If you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus, you consider uh, your relationship with God is, is secure because of what Christ has done for you. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, we invite you to partake of the elements with us this morning to celebrate who we are in Jesus. If you're here today and you go, I don't know about that, and I'm not sure where I am, there's prayers printed in your bulletin. Love for you to read through those, help direct your thoughts during this time. If you've got questions about what it means to follow Jesus or what it means to have a saving relationship with Him, would you please come talk to us after? We'd love nothing more than to talk to you about what it means to love Jesus to have that relationship with God, to be reconciled despite our sin and God's holiness because of what Christ has done for us. But if you're here today and you're putting your faith and trust in Jesus, we want to spend time remembering that Jesus instituted this time on the night before he would die. And he tells us in, our, in his word to do this in remembrance of him. And so the scriptures record it this way. When the hour had come, Jesus And his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And he took the bread and he gave thanks and he gave it to them. And he broke it, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so I just want to remind you that we celebrate this here today and we will celebrate again in glory with him when he returns. But we get to celebrate who we are in Jesus here together. And so this is the body of Christ given for you. And this is the blood of Christ shed for you. Will you stand as we continue to worship this morning? Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. <clears throat> what love could remember, no wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all-knowing, He counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What Father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest and poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. new every 
every morn Our sins they are many His mercy is more What riches of kindness He lavished on us his blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood neath the debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Every morning our sins they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins they are many, his mercy is more. Our sins they are many. His mercy is more. You may be seated. Uh, as we read and sing those words and we think about God's mercy and what that says is that what we uh, deserve, we weren't given. We, didn't, we don't deserve life, yet He gives us life in fullness. He gives us an opportunity to know the riches of his goodness and his love for us. And as we live here on this earth, we recognize that he's the king and he's rescued us and he saved us and we become worshipers. And then we think about what we deserve as death. Well, death becomes a gift because we get to go and we get to be with the Father <coughs> in his glory, in his presence. And it's something that we all have to deal with. And, uh, it is a gift. And as we, uh, last week, we had uh, Alex that passed away. And yesterday, uh, a brother in Christ, a friend, a saint uh, in Marshall Chambers went to go be with the Lord. And uh, if you guys knew Marshall, man, he just had uh, a deep light of hope and of Christ inside of him that was contagious so their family's here this morning, and we love you guys, and we love Marshall, and we're so thankful that he is with the Father. As Jane just hugged my neck this morning, that he's gone to be with Daddy. He's with the Father now. But we also mourn and lament, and we'll miss him deeply. And we're here for you guys. I'd just like to pray this morning for the Chambers family, um, as he heals our hearts through his word. And through community, just like JP was saying, that's what we're here for, is to walk together. So, Father, we're thankful for your grace and your mercy. We're thankful that when we know you, death becomes a gift and we get to be with you. Where there is no more cancer, there's no more sickness, there's no more sin. <laughs> it's just glory. It's just you. <sighs> Lord, I pray that you place that deep in all of our hearts that we long to be with you one day but while we are here we would be like Marshall we would point others to who you are like to how good you are and how full of grace and kindness and empathy and love thank you for a man that just imitated you for so many years to so many people in so many ways Lord I pray you would be the comforter through the power of the Holy Spirit for the family as they um, go through the days and weeks and months, just celebrating his memory and his life, yet at the same time grieving the loss, his absence. Lord, we pray that you would allow us as a family just to care for one another for your glory. Help us to know how to do that well. We pray this in the name above all names, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, like JP said, if there is any question about who Jesus is, then we would love to talk with you uh, after the service. You can come and, and speak with me or JP or any of the elders this morning. Um, there are a couple of announcements I'd like to share with you that's going on in the month of October. Uh, busy, busy month, fun month. Uh, 
next Sunday, we'll have our, our fall festival here. So that'll be after our gathering. We'll celebrate by having a chili cook-off in the fellowship hall. There'll be a dunk tank. There's a, a cakewalk uh, for you. If everyone can participate. There's sign-up sheets out in the welcome desk, so please uh, Sign up if you're interested in any of those things. If you'd like to bring a cake, you'd like to submit a chili in the cook-off. Also, um, as you go out the, into the foyer today, you'll see uh, Morgan and Andy and our student ministry represented there. We're doing this thing called Grab and Go. It's a fundraiser for our student ministry so that they can go on a fall retreat coming up just to kind of help pay for some of those fees as they go. It's uh, a Grab and Go is that you can grab a plate of barbecue that we are cooking, that the, the students are cooking for you. That's $10 a plate, and that's on October the 24th is when we'll do the, the grab and go. But you can go and get your tickets today. It's $10 a ticket. Uh, they're out there. You can write a check, and uh, Andy will give you more instructions on how to do that. But you grab a ticket, and then you'll bring that ticket on the 24th and get a plate of food. And we we'll also have extra tickets. So if you want to grab a couple and distribute them to friends, neighbors, and have them come and be a part of that as well. It'll be a, a great um, barbecue and a great opportunity just to help our students go to fall uh, on the fall retreat. Also, you'll see out there, Rita will be out there with uh, Operation Christmas Child. It's that time of year where we're filling up shoeboxes. Uh, I think we did 200 last year, so we're going to try to continue to fill shoeboxes and send out not just a gift, not just a monetary moment of, of joy, but something that's inside that box is the gospel is the truth of who Jesus is. And as those boxes are given out, there are teams across the world that present the gospel to those, those, uh, those communities that gather to receive the gifts for their kids and the, for the families. But the best gift is that they get to hear about Jesus. And sometimes that's for the very first time. And so we just pray the power of the Holy Spirit would uh, draw men, women, and children near to his heart and capture them and proclaim them as sons and daughters. And men, we have our men's breakfast on October the 30th at 8 a.m. in the fellowship hall, so please plan on uh, attending that. I'll have a sign-up sheet next week for you guys to sign up so we can have, know how many mouths we're going to feed, but that's on, on the, the 30th um, on a Saturday morning at 8 a.m., so please plan on sticking around for that. Please stand with me for the benediction. Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.